afternoon. First off, I can say you're welcome to wear masks, and I know that there's a few in the audience, but uh, for me personally, getting in front, it's great to be able to talk without the mask today. All right? Uh, but we like to welcome everyone to our Passing Over History. We have a, uh, they're all good, but we have a, a great one today. I always refer to Dee as a, a purebred, uh, you know, uh, Clayton, because both of her lines are long time. Uh, Clay, so she has not been watered down, distilled. She's a purebred. <laughs> All right. So, uh, anyways, passion over history. I try to say it every time. This is a partnership amongst the Thousand Islands Museum, the historian's office. Again, if anyone's new, I am the historian. I'm Tom LeClaire, and I welcome you here today. But we also have the sesquicentennial uh, committee is involved, and we got our banner, it is the 150th year for the Clayton Village, and that's why this program is here today, and why you're here to enjoy in it. But we also have the uh, Clayton Opera House, the TPAF, uh, they're letting us uh, free use of the building, so uh, hats off to them. But D, I know a lot of people in the community know you, I'm getting to know you better all the time, and that's good. Uh, Neil's here somewhere, out there he I'm is. Not, I'm yeah. not sure, right? I'm not there you go. <laughs> well, she found you interesting enough. Uh, but D, I'm going to turn the time over to you and thank you for all the preparation and everything that you're prepared to share. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hello, David. As you know, I am Belinda Ann Fuller. My maiden name is Three. Most of you know me as Dee or D. I was born in Watertown, March 2nd, 1952, and raised in Clayton. I married David Bradlaugh in 1975. We had two sons, Jerome and John Paul. David passed in 1990, and then later, I married Neil Fuller in 2000, and I have a stepson, Neil III. I would like to share my family memories, and my memories of growing up in Clayton. Hopefully, my memories will bring up yours to share. Everyone has a story. I would like to share, my story begins with my great-grandfather, William Streets, who is also Betty Streets' grandfather. This, there he is right there. And I have a picture of Betty Streets when she was a young girl with her parents and her brothers. So if you want to look at this later. Uh, my great-grandfather, William, was born and raised in England. When he was older, he moved to Scotland, where he met his wife, Elizabeth McCall. William and Elizabeth had seven children. My grandfather, Edward Alexander, also known as Ted, was the oldest son. In 1893, when my grandfather, Ted, was 16, my great-grandfather, William, moved the family to Gananoque, Canada, from Dalmany, Scotland. William operated a stone quarry in Gananoque, and later, later he moved to Grimstone and operated a stone quarry there. My grandfather, Ted, worked as a stone mason in those quarries. Several years later, when Grandpa was 32, he changed the career and started EA Streets Insurance Agency and sold real estate. His first, he first started his agency in a building next to Hungerford Hard, Hardware around 1909. And I have a picture of his first office. And that, and then he later built across the street where Courage My Love is now. And, and my grandfather became a leading citizen of the community. He married Lena Cole, June 1909. Her father was Frank Cole, the trained doctor. And the picture over on the wall, too. I got this from Corbin's studio. And Verda told me the name of the dog was Miser. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> so, anyways. Um, and when my brother Steve was old enough, Grandpa gave him Frank Cole's gold pocket watch, the watch he used as a train conductor, as, as a conductor on the train. I asked Steve, why did he give the watch to him? Grandpa had older 
grandsons. And Steve said, because Grandpa saw that he was a lot like him, serious and focused, cut from the same claw. So to speak. <laughs> My great grandfather, Frank Cole, and family lived in a house where Ernie Jones lives now, on the corner of Huguenin and Merrick. And that house, well, there's a picture of my grandmother on, this, on the steps of, of the house. It used to have a beautiful porch. Um, and uh, the house used to be brick, too. My great-grandfather was married to Ada Kenyon, and they had one daughter, Lena Delinda, who I am named after. My grandparents, Ted and Lena Streets, had a house built next door to Frank and Ada Cole, where the Dixons live now, which is this house here. It was different from what it is today. And, um, and um, where the Dixons live. And um, where am I? my grandparents' house could have my grandparents' house could have been built by the Kenyans. They were contractors, and they were relatives. You know. This was the house my dad, Willie, and his three sisters grew up in. My dad, my grandfather, and great-grandfather, and great-uncles all belonged to the Masonic Lodge. And my grandmother was an Eastern star. Their meetings were held on the third floor, on this floor. And these are a picture of, of, the, of them at a Mason meeting, my grandmother in the middle. And this is a program they had on the 101st anniversary uh, of the Masons, 1853 to 1954. Yeah. So, and this has a program in it, and the menu they had, and, and all the men that were in this program, or in this program. Um, now on my mother's side, my grandparents, Maude and Albert Bushard, lived around the corner from the Streets family in the brick building on Huguenin Street, now owned by, by my cousin Bonnie Bushard. My mother, Pat Bushard, and her two brothers, of course, sisters, grew up in that house. My grandmother, Maude Bushard, was 50 years old when she was widowed, and so she took in rumors to make ends meet. My mom was a, uh, was on a, a basketball and football cheerleader, and uh, when she was older, she was on a bowling team, and they won the Syracuse WIBC 37th Annual Championship in 1954. <laughs> uh, picture that. Um, my dad was in the Army during World War II. He was stationed at Schofield Army Base. He had a dance band, and he, con he conducted and played the trumpet to entertain the troops. This kept him out, out of the war zone because the Army needed him and his band to keep the troops' morale up. My dad loved Hawaii, and he probably would have stayed there, but his father wanted him to come home and work in the business. When dad came home, my mother, who was five years younger than dad, was 18 then. They started dating in marriage in 1947. Mr. Marriage. Mr. Um, Dad acquired a license and became a general insurance agent and worked with his father at the agency. We got to watch the Christmas parade from the picture window at the agency when it was cold outside. My dad and mom lived in the apartment over the agency with my brothers, Ted and Steve, before Gib and I were born. Later, my father bought the building next door to the business. He sold the building to Mary Elaine Constantino. She started the Eagle Shop. And these are the pictures of, and there's a picture of, it used to be a smoke shop before it was an eagle shop. I have a picture oh, there too. I don't know the full name, I couldn't read it. <clears throat> My dad also owned the building next to the eagle shop 
which is torn down and is a parking lot now. And the building was Charlie and Dally's Restaurant. I remember going there with my parents for breakfast. My parents bought a house on John Street, the skinny house across from Cummings Funeral Home, where, you know, it's in between the, the stone house and the other house. It was a skinny house. That's where my parents owned. Oh. <clears throat> and um, we, where we, I was about five, until I was about five. I used to play with Mark and Mary Ann Hall. They would run around the caskets in the funeral home. <laughs> <laughs> and then Antoine Tatro's house was next to the funeral home. He was a famous healer and healed people in his home. I can remember playing around in his house and would run outside and gaze at all the people lined up to go into his house. The line went all the way up to the park. And I remember saying to myself, what are all these people doing here? And then I went off to play. <laughs> and when I was about five, we moved to our new house located across French Creek Bridge on the riverside. My grandfather, Ted, had the house built for us. That was about 1957. Before the house was built, there was a cottage there that we stayed in during the summer. Then the house was built on the same site where the cottage was. There were a lot of little cottages around the area where we lived. We did not have a dock. We had a wooden boat, rowboat, pulled up on the shore. When my, and then later we had a crib dock built. My grandfather kept his wooden boat at the dock and would go out fishing. When my grandfather was young, he fished from a skiff. Fishing from the skiff here, doing a short dinner. And then he was on his um, vessel with fish dry up. And here he is with a tie and knickers. <laughs> they, they did not dress up back then. I mean, they dressed up, but they didn't have casual wear back then. <laughs> um, my dad had a black inboard, that's us right here, black inboard boat. And he would take us fishing, boating, and swimming at Potter's Beach. Back then, there were very few boats at the beach, not crowded like today. My brother and I had an aluminum rowboat with a two-horse motor on it. We took turns driving the boat around in front of the house. As we got older, we had a 16-foot outboard with a 65-horse Evanru motor that we used for water skiing when I was about 14. I would drive the boat so my brother, Steve Kislowski, he was about 16. Yeah, we have pictures of us skiing. I would, we would, we could ski all around French Creek Bay. There was no <coughs> marina, there was no marina on the side where Denny's cottages were. Jean Shamanti lived there and ran the cottages. Later, Denny's cottages were torn down and townhouses were built. And then Bayside Marina came later. On the other side of the bay was Mercer's Marina, which is now French Bay Marina, owned by Kellogg's. The boathouse and docks that extended way out into the bay were not there until 1969. We had a few years of skiing in the bay without um, obstructions. My brother Steve worked for the contractor Jim Erickson and helped build Mercer's boathouse and docks. My brother told me that the construction site in January started in January and went to December. In January, they drilled holes in the ice, drove pylons down 20 feet, sometimes 100 feet, till they hit bedrock. The boathouse was well constructed. The men that worked on the construction, my brother, with my brother were Wayne Erickson, Danny Chalair, Willie Wood, Bill Malone, Donnie Zimmer, Pat Basnett, Ronnie Finney, Joffrey Foltz, Tom Timmy, Fred Niles, Bob Moschel, George Basnett, and Cheezer Wilder. According to Steve, Jim Erickson used to boast that all the men on his crew were from Clayton. <laughs> we used to gas up at Rice's gas dock 
located where McMally's restaurant used to be, and now is a privately owned place next to the Centennial Park. Steve worked there in the summer and said, on a busy morning, up to six fishing guides, Rowley Garnsey, Clark Jackson, Mr. Ferguson, to name a few, would come in to gas up and get bait, then proceeded to the village docks to pick up their parties. We lived next door to Dan's Cottages, owned by Joyce and Louis Bedore. In the summer, there would be boat races out in the bay. The boat races would come with their the boat racers would come with their families and would spill over from Dan's cottages to our yard with their boats. For a young kid, that was very exciting. I remember a lady coming up to our house and asked if we were a restaurant where they could get breakfast. <laughs> when I was about 15, I would go by boat to Gananoque with my friends Chuck Ryan and Rick Keegan. Docking at the town docks, we did not check in with customs. We walked up the street to the bakery. We bought tarts and other pastries, and then we would get in the boat and go back to Clayton. Chuck, Rick, and I would go water skiing on the other side of Grindstone toward Canada, the backside. Sometimes we would ski in Canadian water. I remember a gas dock and store on that side of Grindstone where we could get some food. I think it was owned by Calhoun. In later years, when I was married to David Bramall, we were on the river all the time because he worked as a caretaker for Heinemans, who owned most of Picton. They bought Picton in 1945, and David's father, Jerome, was their first caretaker. He worked for them for 30 years and developed beautiful walking paths all over the island. There's a granite stone quarry on the island the stone from the Museum of Natural History in New York City came from this quarry. When David died, I asked Heinemans if I could get a headstone for him from Picton. They agreed. I found the granite stone lying on the shore, just waiting to be picked up. It was beautifully cut. David's brother Barney and a few other guys went down to the island and put it on a flat barge, brought it up to Reese Street, and Cousins picked it up and engra engraved his name on it, and it is in the St. Mary Cemetery. My earliest memories of downtown were when my mother took my younger brother Gibby and I shopping. We would go to the Five and Dime store, Palmer's, where the St. Lawrence Gallery is now, located, and I remember there were tables of merchandise for five and ten cents. We stood this <laughs> Mom would take us to Graves Pharmacy on Dave Street, located where Cantwell Agency used to be. My brother and I would have a cherry coke at the soda fountain while Mom shopped, or I would read the comments at the front of the store. <laughs> when, I, when I was about five, my grandma's streets would take me and my mother and Gibby to Dee's Bakery to have glazed donuts and a coke. I love that. And it's ingrained in my memory. <laughs> As I remember, Dee's Bakery was located about where the Centennial Park is. Our family physician was Dr. Pilpel. He had a heavy German accent. He lived and did his practice in the house where the transitional living people live now on the corner of James and Huguenin. I can still see his wife, who was his nurse, opened the big sliding doors and saying, next, Delinda? <laughs> I was young and scared to death, clinging to my mother. <laughs> Across the street was my dentist, Dr. Robert Fitzgerald. His practice was in the building where Campbell's business was. It was upstairs. Dr. Maloney and Dr. Eppolito were in that practice too. When I was about seven, I took tap dancing lessons at the Clayton Opera House. It was held on the main floor. And when I was 12, I took weaving class from the craft school, which was on the third floor of the Opera House, on this floor. And this was about 1964. After that, the craft school acquired Antoine's Tatra's home on John Street. It was called Hand Weaving Museum, Thousand Island Craft School, and now Thousand Island Art Center. 
Also, in my younger years, Mom took my brother and I shopping at the Clayton department store, which is owned by the Rothenberg sisters, located where Ryan is decorating his now. That's where I got my PF Flyer sneakers. I thought I could run faster and jump higher. <laughs> I did shop there when I was a teenager. The Rothenberg sisters were very nice to me. They lived in a really nice apartment above the store. Another store my mom took me to was Schaefer's Grocery Store, located where River Yoga is now. I remember Schaefer's store had a um, display in the window, a neat wooden beehive with wooden bees, big wooden bees, I remember that. Um, there was another little store on the corner of American Union, owned by Fates. I had a bad experience there. I was little, my brothers and I were getting ice cream when I walked out of the store, my ice cream fell off my cone. Already on the sidewalk, there was a hose pulled out and a broken jar of mustard. I was upset that I lost my ice cream. I bent down to look at the mess on the sidewalk and Mr. Fink came out and yelled at me. <laughs> he thought I had pulled the hose out and broke the jar. Boy, did I cry. <laughs> and I think he was a gouchy old man. At least he was to me. <laughs> There used to be a newsstand on the corner of John and Riverside Drive, where Ryman's store is now. Laura Ryman ran it. She was nice to us teenagers. I loved the soda machine on the corner. You could get oil palm, grape, or orange, and cream soda. We also hung out there because there were block dances in the street on John Street. There was Charlie Siplow's IGA store grocery store, located where Coyote Moon is now. Charlie Sipple was owned it and ran it. When my parents would go to Florida, we had a charge account there and would buy groceries. My brothers and I were in high school. Charlie had the best steaks. <laughs> my other recollections of grocery stores when I was young were Bertie Consoles, where H&R Block is now. I used to walk across French Creek Bridge to the store to get a candy bar, usually a peanut butter cup. Carpenters was located on the corner of James and Mary Street next to the KFC. I went there after church school. Burt Patterson's store was located on the corner of James and State Street across from Jerry Hammond's gas station, which is now Finney's Redemption. We would stop the store on the way home from school. We attended movies at the <coughs> Bertrand Theater, which is now the Lear Bistro. I recall my cousin walking in when the movie just started. It was, The Russians Are Coming. It started out pitch black on the movie screen and she could not see, so she sat down. And when the movie brightened up, she was startled that she was sitting next to a stranger when there were lots of seats all around. Needless to say, there was no low lighting or safety lighting on the floor. <laughs> Uh, when I was 16, I worked as a chambermaid for Bertrand's Motel Hotel. I cleaned the motel units and some hotel units. The long timers like Beale and Kennedy did the hotel. We used to have our break in the hotel lobby. When the hotel was to be demolished, they had an auction, and I've been on a small wicker chair, paid $25, and I still have it. <laughs> I have memories of walking across the French Creek Bridge in a cold winter evening to skate at the rink. It was located across from the lion's field. There was a wood stove in the shack where we could get warm and put on our skates. They used to pipe music outdoors and we would skate around to the Beatles, I Wanna Hold Your Hand. Of course, I would skate on French Creek Bay when the ice was good. One year, I remember many people on the bay skating. It was black ice. The Rabbit Boys were out there skate sailing. I heard stories of my Uncle Noel Malone in the old days when the ice used to freeze safe, skated sailing across the ice to Gananoque. Oh, From my house, I could walk out on the ice to where the horse races were going on. I have an old video of my Grandpa Ted passing around a bottle of brandy at the races to keep warm. It always ended in somebody's back pocket. <laughs> my, my grandpa and a group of businessmen started the horse races. Grandpa would award the winners with a trophy. 
The horse race was edited in the early 60s. The Harbor Inn Diner originated across where I lived on State Street. It was two cottages made into a diner. We used to enjoy going across the street for breakfast and glazed donuts. As you probably noticed, I love glazed donuts. <laughs> <laughs> then the Harbor Inn moved to St. Mary Street, to Mary Street, where the Woodboat Brewery is now, and the Inlet Diner was located on Mary Street across from the Harbor Inn. We used to cross country ski on the roads to the Inlet for coffee. That was in the 70s. The roads were not bare like they are today. There was a public beach right behind the Inlet Diner where I learned to swim. That was about 1957, I was five. Of course, everybody ate at McCormick's restaurant. They had a lot of wedding receptions there. My Aunt Helen and Uncle Noel Malone had their daughter, Marsha, and son-in-law Dick Allen's wedding reception there. I remember when it burned down and Paul D. being killed. Such a tragedy. When I was 18, I worked at the Driftwood Restaurant. I started out waitressing and then worked as an evening cook. I worked for Joan and Rick Carter. The restaurant was owned by Joan's parents, Doris and Jerry Russell. But then Joan and Rick took it over. They were young. It was the summer of 1970. The kids that worked at the restaurant with me were from my school, most of them a year younger. Some of them were Sylvia Cyril, Sunny B. Shaw, Gold Bazin, and even an out-of-towner from Cape Vincent, Linda Lawrence who later became my sister-in-law. Needless to say, we all got along and had a great time that summer. I had one mishap, well, one mishap when I worked there. The gas stove I had to light, Rick showed me how to do it, but he did not warn me about leaving the gas on too long before you, you light it. Well, I did. The gas flame hit me in the face. I was so startled that I flew out into the dining room. It was a narrow kitchen, and I landed curled up on the floor among the customers. That was a bit dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> While I had my face in my hands, I looked up and saw a man jump up from his seat. So I jumped up and ran back into the kitchen, and Joan called my brother Steve to come and take me to the emergency room. My face was lightly burned, and my hair and eyebrows were singed. Unfortunately, the restaurant burned down, not while I worked there. <laughs> I don't remember the year. <laughs> the Driftwood was located between the Golden Anchor restaurant, which is now Deprezio's, and Pearl's department store, which is now Rack's. In elementary school, it seemed that my teachers were old. I had Mrs. Markham for kindergarten, the streets first grade, Mrs. Petrie second, Mrs. Carter third, Miss Ethel Daniel, four, and we were the last class she had when she retired. <coughs> Fifth grade was Mrs. Sullivan, and sixth was Gail Michelle. Actually, she started teaching the, the, her career, the class before my class. She was young. I was baptized Catholic and brought up in the church. I received all my sacraments at St. Mary's, married twice there, and will probably be buried from there. And I always sang in the church choir. When I was young, I attended church school at St. Mary's on Wednesdays. We were bused to St. Mary's from Clayton Central, which is now Gardino Elementary. When we got older, we would walk. I remember at St. Mary's school, there was a convent house in between the school and the church. The Sisters of the Holy Cross lived there and taught for many years. Their order was from Canada. The school was built in 1907. As you know, there was a fire at the school and it looked quite different in the 70s. Oh, here. See the fire. That's the, the, the top picture is, no, the bottom picture is the old school. The top is was the newer. My aunt, Virginia Lake, who was 98, related to me an account her mother told her that when the 1918 pandemic hit, St. Mary's School's gymnasium was turned into a hospital with the nuns tending to the people sick and dying with the Spanish flu. 
My grandmother, Maud Bushard's parents, Mary and Alexander Yacht, and her brother Theodore died there from the Spanish flu. My great grandmother, Mary Yacht, is the daughter of Joseph Lonsway, the Medal of Honor recipient from the Civil War. This is him. You probably know this picture. I got this picture when I went to Corbin's, and I told her that I was related to him, and she said, Everybody in Clayton claims they're related to him. <laughs> <laughs> this is his picture of his medal. And this, this, uh, this is in the Thousand Island, his medal is in the Thousand Island Museum. Um, most of you probably know that my father, Willie, was a very talented musician. He could not read a bit of music, but he could play anything he heard. He learned guitar and then he taught himself piano. He also played trumpet in Clayton Central High School Band. He played taps in the Army, and on Memorial Day, he played taps at the Clayton, the Colville, and Grindstone Cemeteries. Dad, Dad also played in many dance bands. There he was playing the trumpet in the Army. Didn't play in there. He played in many dance bands. This is um, the dance band he was in. It was in Calumet Castle. He was there in 1950. Um, he played the Don first. He taught Don first how to play trumpet. And uh, then he played with uh, Joe Hessler on the saxophone and um, Freddie on the drums. That was my dad on the piano. Um, and he played with other talented musicians and also his friends like Lloyd Fox tenor sax, Randy Wagner, Manjo, and Hall played harmonica. He also accompanied many singers on, on the guitar or piano. Helly Anderson loved that and accompanied her because he could transpose and play in any key she wanted. Dad taught my brothers and I guitar, and he also taught my cousins Joe and Albert Bushard. My brother Ted, Joe and Albert, along with Ed Basnett, Steve Lobo, formed a band in high school called the Legal Tones. Uh, this picture of them in the bottom here. They played for dances in different schools, and in the summer had bar dances at Uncle Robert's farm. They won the Battle of the Bands held in Watertown at the Olympic Theater, and they played on the Danny Bridges show at WWNY. They were very popular. In around 2006, they had a 40-year reunion at the Clayton Arena, and 800 people came. It was very magical. After college, Joe and Albert went on to form a heavy metal band, Blue Oyster Cult. They had many hits. I played clarinet in the junior high school band. <laughs> and, and senior choir. Our marching band played in the Goodwill Day Parade which happened on our side of the river one year and the Canadian side the next. The towns where we marched were Cape Vincent, Clayton, Alexander Bay, and in Canada were Kingston, Kananaque, Brockville. We also marched in the Christmas parade every year. It was really cold and our instruments would freeze up. I remember Jane Wilson trying to adjust her flute to get it to play. And, and, and the end of it fell to the ground, and the car ran over it flattened. <laughs> I played a, in a clarinet choir in junior high, and I remember playing for the Eastern Star women, and they walked around the room in their ball gowns and, and uh, long black gloves. And, and it took place probably right here. Um, and then, and I started playing in the senior high school concert band when I was in seventh grade. In 1965, I was 13, our band director, Frank Satchi, took us to the New York World's Fair to perform. We played in an area outside where high school bands could perform. The morning performance we did not so well, but the afternoon we did great and got a lot of compliments. The best part of the trip was going on the rides and seeing the exhibits. <laughs> the Clayton Community Band was formed by Katherine Ingerson, Rena Candler, 
and our conductor, Glory Lesser, in 2002. I was there at the beginning and played for 10 years. Now I have given my clarinet to my grandson so he can carry on the Speaks family traditions. <laughs> To grow up in a wonderful place like Clayton, to be able to boat, ski, swim in such a beautiful river is a blessing. I am so thankful. Yes. Thank you. I'll open it up for questions. If you have any questions, speak loud so we can hear it on the, uh, the microphone. Or any memories you have that add to mine. Great. Uh, I will open up, uh, you showed the picture of Frank Cole oh, earlier, yeah. and uh, we were talking about something about Frank that maybe you weren't aware of until today. <laughs> um, yes, uh, Tom has it here. Um, he was a pre the president of Clayton, because they had presidents before they were mayors, and um, in 1899. Hmm. And um, he, he, was, he, he served until 1900. So that's, that's well, he, he took he, he brought the village across the uh, turn of the century, yes. 1899. So there was a lot going on. I'm wondering if they were worried that the computers were going to break down. <laughs> 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 uh, so, anybody want to add to my story? You got your own stories. Story was my story only. Well, I was before you, but yeah, everything that you're talking about very clear in my mind. Yes, yeah. I was summer, but at least uh, I did water skiing in French Bay, mm -hmm. and then we went, went over near Bluff and back in there too. Which you couldn't do today. Although right. my brother managed to find the one post in the middle of French Bay and go flip it, hit it when he oh. flipped over. That was yeah. Another story. And I also, um, I was my brother was in those races in '64 oh. and '65, and I was a crash boat person, and I saved person, and we had to get him over to the dock where De uh, Denny's cottages were, and they're all waving to me. Him over everything. So I had, I had actually all the same experience except I didn't go to school here in the winter time. We were here in the winter time. Although we would have winter vacations where we stayed at Bertrand. So it is, it's very similar to everything that you talked about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I'm sure, but oh, Bertrand's. <laughs> I was in the movie house. And we did go see the Russians are coming, oh, and then we saw It's a Man 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 World. My mother loved that one, but I went with my uncle and, and my cousins and all, and I was at the end roll, and some kid came up and stole my pocketbook, and my uncle was able to flip it around, and his feet were sticking up in the air. We had all these crazy experiences, and, I, and I'm sure uh, Mr. Bertrand really got tired of it because the kids were horrible in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, All right. Is that Mr. Cole? Are you related to the nation at Earl? You know? No. No. Uh, he came mm -hmm. from uh, Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, obviously, there's a lot of great information here. Uh, as a historian, I'm going to put her on speed dial. Because if I ever need to verify a fact, I know who to go to. <laughs> We're going to welcome everyone to uh, come up afterwards and have any one-on-one -on -one questions with Dee. But Dee, uh, the uh, prestigious certificate, I <laughs> um, want to thank you and uh, again for coming out and being our uh, Hashing Over History guest speaker. And again, so much history that you personally know. Um, I joke a little bit when I say put you on speed dial, but there's some truth to it. <laughs> uh, you're going to hear from me again. <laughs> Thank you.